All right. This week on the second episode of the Black Real Award podcast, voting starts on Monday. It's about that time. It is this week's show is our 21st annual Black Real Award preview. I am joined by my co-host, the man with the plan, Syracuse University, Indiana University, Cordell Martin. We call him C-Movie. What's going on, Cordell? Hey, just living the dream, getting ready for these Black Real Awards. How are you? Man, you you know, you sounded real excited right now, man. So hold on a second. Let me give you some, give you some, so you have access, right? So you can actually do what you need to do. Um, again, uh, we're coming off of a, a big awards week where the NAACP Image Awards, the Screen Actors Guild, and the Golden Globes all announced nominations. Our nominations are coming up on February the 18th. But this week is important, so we wanted to preview for any of the voters who are watching the show to give you the big six, as we call it. Actually, we're not giving them the big six because we're not doing director today, right? Uh, actually, we are. We're going to talk about directors, films, actors, and actresses. Okay, well, we're giving you the big six. All right, so cool. I like the big six. You'll We'll, we'll use that phrase a lot. So without any further ado, Cordell Martin, give them the uh, preview. All right, here we go. All righty. Oh, I like how you did that. Okay, look at that right there. That is, uh, what was his name? Stormin' Norman from the Five Bloods, the late, great Chadwick Boseman. It's a great picture of him, man. And that's a great usage of that uh, preview graphic. Good job there, Mr. Martin. There we go. All, All right. right. So what we're looking at, man, let's, like, let's talk about our top contenders. And you have... Uh, a total of seven, Am I, if I'm correct, if I'm counting correctly, yeah, seven. Uh, looks like Judas and the Black Messiah, the United States versus Billie Holiday, One Night in Miami, Soul, The Five Bloods, Malcolm and Marie, and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Out of these films, we're giving people the option of picking three, Cordell. Our voting academy is getting three of these, huh? Yep. Wow. <laughs> That's okay. mad respect. Actually, you know what we should do, Cordell, is we should give them five for this one and three for everything else, because, you know, it's going to be hard to do three out of that, man. No, I think we make it difficult for them. You, you want to make it difficult? I mean, you know, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, because, you know, even even the other critics groups that I, I belong to that gave you three of everything else, they gave you five of these, man. So I'm just saying, man, you want to get the best, you want to get the best five you can get. And if you only make them pick three, man, you're going to have some difficult choices. And there's going to be some of these cats that ain't going to make it. I'm telling you. Somebody ain't going to make it that's that's worthy. But let's talk a little bit about these films because you've seen them all now, right? I have. All righty. And I think we before we, we get into seeing them all, uh, our special guest who we are not going to see our special guest, but I think she's going to give us something. Uh, Miss Shereen Nicole from Adobe Radio, or should I just call it the Adobe Network? Well, both things are true, but so either. Oh, okay. So we just getting a name today. That's that's what we're doing right now. Pardon me. I have a photo up, but maybe it's not working. You can also you can also see my beauty filter. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Shereen Nicole, welcome to episode two of the Black Real Award podcast. We are honored to have you. Uh, as I've told people, Shereen Nicole is uh, one of the bright lights in our industry, uh, someone whose work I respect a lot. And I love her voice uh, and, and not just the way it sounds, but what she says and how it's framed. So her perspective is one that is much needed and I'm glad that she is joining us today. Shereen, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. I'm very happy to be here. I am code switching because I know that's what you like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we are kidding, we are hello. now. No, go ahead, Tareen. I said just kidding. Hello. Hey, so we're talking about the top contenders. Uh, we've already set it up to let people know that Black Real Award voting begins on Monday. But if, if there are any of our voters that are at home who are still trying to make up our minds, um, I was trying to talk uh, the nominating chairman into giving the uh, voting academy five choices in this category and three for everything else. And, you know, of course, he he is unrelenting. He wants to make it 
a Rubik's Cube of voting and make it as difficult as he can make it. So let's talk a little bit about these films. Have you had an opportunity to see all, all of these seven films? I think you've seen six out of seven. For the most part, yep. Good answer. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the film at the top, Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, Cornell, I know you had an opportunity to see this film last night. Um, the story of the uh, FBI and their COINTELPRO program uh, having William O'Neill, played by Lakeith Stanfield, infiltrate uh, the, the Black Panther Party headquarters to have them get close to the chairman, Fred Hampton, um, the film stars Daniel Kaluuya as Fred Hampton, Lakeith Stanfield as um, William O'Neill, and Dominique Fishback as Deborah Johnson, who is the girlfriend of Fred Hampton. Uh, give me some feedback. On now this known point. as Mama Akua, is that right? Uh, no, you're talking about like Mama Akua? Is that her name now? Akua. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, yes, now not. Thank you, Shireen. Yes. So, Cordell? Yeah, um, I think Judas and the Black Messiah, at least in terms of our awards, came out at the right time. Um, once this film is released next week, it'll be right in the midst of us already completing voting and the nominations um, of our awards. Um, I thought Daniel Kalua just gives a career defining performance in his short career thus far. Um, I think also just for what's going on in the world right now, it's a very timely film. Um, I thought it was well acted, um, shot, um, all of the above. So I definitely think out of these seven films, Judas could be the one to be. Just wow. Basically. Wow. Shaka King did his thing, man. That's, that's Shireen? Well, you know, um, there was a glitch in our, our Warner Brothers account, so I have not seen it yet. They're working on it. So I've only seen, I, I attended a conference, all day conference that I think Macro held about the film and, you know, got to hear some of the comments from Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., from Daniel Kaluuya, uh, Kaluuya uh, Mama Kua, many, many people, Shaka King as well. So at least I got to, to receive that and uh, get a good feeling for the film. All right. So, yeah, and I was, uh, I think I started off, I was very skeptical because I saw the trailer for it and was not feeling Kahlua at all because I couldn't picture him as Hampton. And I think I uh, called Cordell and said, man, unless he does a, a, a Denzel Malcolm transformation, man, I don't know if this thing is going to work. But I thought Shaka King, man, from the moment this film opens, you know, the recreation of, of Chicago in, in the uh, late 60s, early 1970s, uh, how it felt in the streets, the, the police harassment that made the Black Panther Party uh, so prevalent and so necessary. Uh, the fact that they included scenes where Hampton was, was literally uniting with other groups, uh, other ethnic races, you know, white, poor whites, uh, other minorities, Hispanic. Um, I thought they nailed that. Uh, the fact that Martin Sheen plays... Um, J. Edgar Hoover and plays him under makeup because at first I didn't recognize him and I kept hearing the voice. I was like, it sounds like Martin Sheen. Oh, that is Martin Sheen. <laughs> so I thought, I thought he nailed it and really did an amazing job. I, I thought it was a powerful, impactful, incendiary performance is what I described it as. So I think you, you may have a point because I think it's not just our awards, but any awards. Whatever films come out toward the end are always the ones that draw the most attention because those are the ones that are fresh in everybody's mind. And to that point, our next film, The United States versus Billie Holiday, will drop the end of February. But, you know, Hulu being Hulu, they were smart. They got that movie out uh, to as many people as possible. Cool. And, um, you know, so... And when you talked about uh, uh, an impactful performance and a career-defining performance, Audra Day and her film debut, all I can say is one word, wow. <laughs> Cordell, let's talk a little bit about, uh, well, actually, I'll start with Shireen. And I know that Shireen is still in the midst of having fun with this movie. Um, what are you thinking about this movie so far and Audra Day's performance in it? 
I have to say that um, Audra Day surprised me, not because I had any expectations of her performance, but because she so fully embodied the mannerisms and, and the strength of Billie Holiday, as well as the vocal tone in that singing voice, which is incredible because nobody sings like Lady Day. No. Except that Audra Day really lived up to the name <laughs> and, and, yeah. and brought that. I think that that's me, but disregard that. Keep on, keep on going. I'll handle that. That's that's what I have to say. It was it was stunning. You could really feel Billie Holiday in everything that she did, and you could hear it mm -hmm. in what she was able to do with her tones. No, I okay. got you. And I absolutely agree. Um, I think the fact that she so fully committed to the role, I mean, she did everything. I mean, she didn't drink, she didn't smoke uh, for a year before. I think she took that on as well as some of the, the other more promiscuous pieces that went into it that uh, I think Lee Daniels, her and Lee Daniels seem to be cool because I know there are a lot of people that are like, man, I'm not really going there with a male director. Uh, Cordell, talk a little bit about your feelings about Andre Day's performance and Trevante Rhodes uh, in, a, in a role that a lot of people may not think is, I mean, may think it's fictional, but that's actually, I don't think they had a real love story, but that's a real person who did many of the things that the film depicts him doing. Yeah, you're, you're right on the head with that. And I agree with Shireen on just Andre Day's performance. I thought it was captivating. I thought she captured the essence of Billie Holiday. And it goes to show with Lee Daniels, although he's not necessarily my favorite director, but he's really good at getting his actors to really just push themselves and give their all in their performances. If you think like Monique and Precious or um, Gabrielle Sidibe and Precious as well. And with Andre right. Day, he does a really great job at letting them just in the moment. Um, yeah, so that's my thoughts on the film. I don't know how well it's going to do in terms of the overall nomination count. I think Andre Day is going to do really well in terms of her nominations in her categories for actress and breakthrough actress and possibly original song um, and maybe a few below the line categories like costumes and production design. Right. Yeah, right. the, you know, the funny thing with Lee Daniels is he really knows where the pain points are. Well, that's true. <laughs> you write about that part. Man. <laughs> and he Man. presses them to, to push these performances. So, Yeah, and, and, and I would be fascinated. I've interviewed Lee Daniels. I think I interviewed him like when Precious was out, but I would love to talk to him again about that because you're right, Shireen. He has a way, and maybe that's a part of his casting process. I mean, because I don't think you bring an actor in and then – you know, once he reads the script, he goes, okay, this is what you want. I think there has to be a conversation before when you sit down having lunch, if you're about to offer him the role, hey, man, if you take this on, you know, you're going to need to do A, B, and C. I mean, would you agree? I have to imagine that in the audition process or in some process of conversation and developing the role, he has to know that they can take those characters to where he needs them to. He did a similar thing. Well, that wasn't his movie. He produced Monsters Ball. He didn't direct Monsters Ball, but it was something similar that happened with Halle Berry in that movie, no matter how you feel about it. Uh, so yeah, there's there's something about Lee Daniels. You know, a, a lot of what he gets out of Taraji P. Henson is the same. So I'm not sure. We need to go investigate and find out what Lee Daniels is doing on these sets. <laughs> well, he did a movie years ago uh, that had Helen Marin and uh, Cuba Gooden Jr. And I can't remember, was it Shadow Boxer? I think that's what it was called. Something like that, yeah. And then, and then he did a follow-up movie where he had Nicole Kidman and Zac Efron. And there's the famous scene where <laughs> I think Efron had a starfish trapped on his face and he had Nicole Kidman urinate. And I was like, how is Lee Daniels getting these people to do this stuff? So you're right. I think there may be something either in the audition, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking about him sitting at a table at Spago's going, all right, Cordell, if you want to take this role on, man, <laughs> you need to do this, this, and this. And you go, yeah, I guess you Lee Daniels, I guess I'll take a shot. So, I mean, I don't know, but you're right, Shereen. I think maybe we do need to, to have a deeper dive into 
the, the process of how he develops these characters and the trust that these actors have in him to perform certain tasks, so. Right, because barring what, what you were talking about with Golden Showers or whatever that was. Uh, <laughs> that's, what was. that's what it was. Barring that, I, I feel like that that level of vulnerability in, a, in an artist takes trust, so I do agree with you. Yes, yes, yes. And speaking of actors with trust, our next movie I want to discuss of course, is Regina King's debut, One Night in Miami. And this is an interesting one to me. Of course, you know, everybody knows the story of four icons, which I thought, again, you know, I didn't know that this was actually a thing that occurred. Now, the dialogue may all be fictional, but they actually did meet at the Hampton Inn after uh, Cassius Clay won the heavyweight championship. And I was always skeptical because I knew that Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X had a relationship, right? And I knew that him and Sam Cooke were really, really close. Didn't know the Jim Brown, Muhammad Ali dynamic, but to find out that it was a real thing, I went, wow. And I think the first thing I thought of when I saw the end result of One Night in Miami was that Regina King, their director, as an actor, is more accomplished than the four of these guys together. I mean, I don't think that's a stretch to say that, right? No, no, that's not a stretch at all. Yeah. Regina is king. Yeah, yes. so Regina <laughs> Regina commanded respect without having to actually flex too much because they all four of these guys looked at her and went, damn, that's Regina King. <laughs> so we need to bring it because if she's giving us plot points or she's giving us things that we need to work on or how she wants scenes shot, that's Regina King. We'll listen to her. Um, Cordell, I'll start with you. Do you think having Regina King, I mean, now at the end, it, it, you know, this would have been a question to have asked prior to the film's release. But now looking at the end results, do you think that the respect that they had for this director, even knowing that she's coming out the box with her first film, that she tackled a subject, a subject that I'm not going to say it was easy to do, but she didn't go out and make a $200 million action film is her first film. She made a film that had minimal sets, had a lot of dialogue. It's where you had to have the camera position, the, the, the inflection in certain conversations. So I'm saying she took on a film that was very manageable as a directorial debut. I mean, I, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just saying I think it's a very smart move for your first film. Do you think the relationship between, as I said earlier, these four actors and how they perceive her and the performances they gave her, do you think there's a connection there? Yeah, I think definitely the connection, not only with Regina King, but also the men that they portrayed. You know, these are, you know, icons in our community. And so, you know, we really take our portrayals, portrayals of our icons seriously. And so for, you know, actors like uh, Kingsley and Eli, for example, I mean, to play Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X and, you know, follow the footsteps of Will Smith and Denzel Washington, that's a huge, you know, task to take on. Um, I think also with Regina's casting, I think she did a great job of not casting big names for these roles. Um, because, you know, with these young up and coming actors, this is a chance for them to have an opportunity um, in this industry to flex their acting muscle. And it also allows the audience to get lost in the story, as opposed to seeing Denzel playing, you know, Malcolm X or Will Smith playing Muhammad Ali. So um, that at least relieves that distraction that comes sometimes with certain casting choices. Right. Um, and Shireen, you know, I've heard Regina King, I just saw her do uh, a, a variety of magazines doing the directors on directors. So they had her and Melina Matsukis, who did uh, uh, Queen, Queen and Slim uh, together, talking about, you know, the, the, the kind of uplifting the Black man, the love affair with Black men on the screen. Uh, does that come out for you in One Night in Miami? You know, I never thought about it in terms of the love affair with black men. I thought about it as a love affair with black people and mm -hmm. with our history and with the understanding of those themes that these four icons are, are speaking to are still prevalent, right? right, right. And, and, and that discussion is still needed. But hearing that Regina King and Melina Matsukis, who I, 
Melina Matsukas is an incredible director. We already knew that from videos and then she proved it even more with the way that she told the story of Queen and Slim. And now we know that Regina King has this innate ability to understand story. I don't wanna call it innate, like it just like it, it's just there and she didn't work for it, she did, but she has this amazing ability to sink into character. Mm -hmm. And that has translated to where she puts the camera to how I would imagine how she directs her actors and into her understanding of story. And so, yes, these four black men icons are shot with love. They are presented with love. And it's, I think it's a beautiful choice what they do here between uh, Kemp Powers, the writer of both the original play and of this screenplay and, and King, because they they pushed away all of the controversies and all of the scandals, which we know these four men had. And they allow us to focus on the legend and what they mean to the black community. And in that way, it shows the core beauty of them. And, and so that is a triumph in and of itself. And it's funny that people talk about, there's too much talking in this film. And I'm like, you're talking about a film about Muhammad Ali, exactly. Malcolm X, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke, four yep. of the biggest orators of all time. These dudes like to talk. And this is about their conversation of understanding each other. Let them speak. You know, <laughs> that's, that's the whole point of the film. So I hope I answered your question. Yes, I, I fell in love with the performances. They were all really good. I believe them because we know, as Cordell said, we know these, we know their personas so well. We know their, their, their quirks. We know their idiosyncrasies. We know the hitches in their voice. And these guys, again, bodied it, you know, yeah, which, which is so difficult to do in such a challenge. So that was my spiel. I hope I answered your question somewhere you, there. You absolutely did. You absolutely did. There's no wrong answers. Uh, well, I say, uh, no, thank, I was, thank you, teacher. I was going to say, I was going to uh, throw somebody under the bus, but they're not here to defend themselves. So I'm not going to do it. But our next film is uh, one that I, you know, and I'm very transparent, as you can tell, that um, I watched this next film. And my initial reaction is that I did not like this film at all. And I think I shared with Cordell. I was like, man, this is not working for me. And I went back thought about it some more and said, okay, I think the issue was not the film, but it was me because I went into it with an expectation that I thought it was going to be one thing. And then when I watched it again and then again, I accepted it for what it was. And the film, of course, I'm talking about is Soul, uh, the film that, had, that cast Jamie Foxx as the first black lead in a Pixar film. Um, I still don't think it's a perfect film. I think that them trying to explain the great before and the great beyond and some of that, that 20 minute piece that's in the middle, I still think takes a little bit away from the story. But the fact that Kent Powers, who we just, you, uh, Shireen just talked about in One Night in Miami, co-wrote this film with Peter Docter. Um, I just thought Jamie Foxx gave an amazing, empathetic voice performance surrounded by a supporting cast featuring Tina Fey, Wes Love, uh, there's so many talented folks that are in Felicia this film. Rashad. Uh, Felicia Rashad, Angela Thank Bassett. You. So, you know, I'll lead off with you this time, Shireen. Um, so, you know, we have a slide here that has seven films on it. The Soul, can Soul do something? Because Cornell, I think you told me that we've only had one animated film be nominated for best film and best animated film. Can Soul be number two, Shireen? Well, yes. It, it, okay, so let's talk about this. Soul is complicated. Mm -hmm. And it's complicated for a number of reasons. And a lot of that has to do with the way that we are represented as Black Americans, right? So you have this history in, in animation. And, and a lot of times in Disney animation, which Pixar is a part of that umbrella, of transforming black characters into animals, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a thing that happens again and again and again. And unfortunately, spoiler, you guys, that happens again in this movie. I won't go into detail in case you haven't seen it, but it does happen again in this movie. 
And so I think Soul is a better movie than its mistakes allow it to be. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is it's, it's so rich and it's so New York, but it's so black New York. The barbershop is so real. The character of Dez is, is that barber that we either grew up with or we go to right now, who always has that good thing to say and that big smile. You know, the, the, the mother here, um, the jazz that's infused in this film. But there are some of those problems and, 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 and there's so many people of color in this cast, not just black people, but Maori and, you know, and, and, and so them making that one choice of the animal um, transformation was a big mistake. And it might come from them not reading enough about how we feel about our animation, but everything else I think worked well. Now, some people do have some big problems with the before and after, but in the three movements of this film, I actually think when you do allow them to be what they are, they work quite well, but we must always interrogate the problems. And so the problems are absolutely there. Right. Well, is it a good film? It is a good film. It is a good film. So Cornell, I'll pose the same question to you, man. Can Soul, I mean, and you look at the competition and, and, and Shireen is kind of, I'm not going to say new, but Shireen hasn't really been grinding doing this Black Real Award thing as long as Cordell and I have. Cordell, look at, look at the seven films that we have here. Now, think of any other year outside of maybe Black Panther in 2014. I mean, is this amazing or what, what we're looking at right now? Because you'd, you'd have to understand what we're really talking about, Shireen, because, you know, we've had conversations about years where it was lean. <laughs> lean but look at look at these seven films Cordell yeah I mean this is a beautiful thing to see um and mm -hmm. definitely just ties into our overall mission you know in terms of supporting our culture our voices um and our creativity I mean the fact that and, with, and then, none of these are hood films Cordell look, look, mom, you, know. films, you don't have the single black mom you yeah. know you know any slave film. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, man. Just, I mean, just as you put the slide, there, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I'm just staring at it like, wow. And, and then there are other stories beyond these that didn't even make uh, your slide. Like you, th you think about, you know, uh, even though people call it a holiday film, Jingle Jangle, uh, which I thought was fantastic. It uh, is. Black, you know, fantasy, um, black the, holiday magic. Come on. Yeah. 40 year old version. You don't have uh very, you know, very I see it and you have that in the spoiler. Look at look at the look at the, the spoiler. Sylvie's love. Uh, like wow. Miss Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. Farewell or more, I thought was a really, really good film. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I mean, you know, I, I'm proud, Shireen, to have you. And and you know, you heard me say in the intro that what I love most about you is your perspective. Cordell it has the institutional knowledge because we stare at this stuff all the time. And, you know, it's almost like if, if I was getting emotional, a tear would come out because it's like you guys at home don't understand what 20 years, the first 20 years of this century look like and to see where we are. And this wasn't a year like, you know, in 2014 when you knew, you know, like, okay, we got the butler, you got Fruitvale Station. Oh, Lord. We were excited. We were like, woo! Fruitvale, yes, <laughs> yes. But can I say something? Because I feel like the Small Axe films are missing. Well, the study, well, what we did with the Small Axe films, you know, I made a conscious decision because I actually called Amazon and I was like, you know, I know you want Sylvie's to be a TV movie. We're going to include it in and give people an opportunity to vote on it. I couldn't really do the same thing with the Small Axe series because Small Axe, I thought, would work if it was just Small Axe and then instead of separating them out as five films. Um, so well, that's what everyone else has done. A lot of the awards have done small acts as a grouping, but you know, it's screened at Cannes. Uh, well, yeah. not all of them. Three of the films screened at Cannes, right. three of the films screened at the New York Film Festival. So I think this is a glaring omission. Yes, we're well, actually putting it in our TV categories. Yeah, we're going to put it, we're going to put it in, in uh, the, the Black Real Awards for television in August. So, I, you but know. But it was I, at film festivals. This was not a television show. This well, was a series of films. 
Well, the interesting thing is, is that you have literally put me on the spot because, you know, like generally as a rule, right. look, 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 because generally as a rule, you know, you somebody go, well, you know, that decision is above my pay grade. In this case, it's not. It's not. <laughs> so like, flashlight. flashlight. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I honestly, seriously, though, I thought about, I thought about small acts a lot. And I thought one of the problems that you would run into with small acts is that, for instance, Red, White, and Blue, John Boyega, of course, you you put him on the ballot for Best Actor. Um, I was thinking about uh, Letitia Wright. She would have been a support character yes. uh, for, um, uh, what is that, Man, Man, what, what was it called? The, first, the very Mangrove. first episode. Mangrove. Mangrove. Mangrove, thank you. But outside of that, you had a bunch of actors that I don't think had high visibility for the voting, for our voting academy. Come on, the two leads in Lover's Rock for breakout performances. Oh my God, yeah, yeah they, they were great. All right, Cordell, you, you, got the, you got permission. Go ahead on, make it happen, man. Shereen okay. has put us on the spot. I like the spot. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm half British, I'm half black British. Black on both sides, as the, the great Yasin Bey used to say. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to go ahead and put that spot. You put me on the spot, too. So, the, you know, the spot no, no, is... But I think, I think, I think uh, you know, small acts, that, no disrespect to any of the other filmmakers that we've talked about. I think the fact that Steve McQueen was able to put out five movies and drop them simultaneously during a pandemic, man, brother. <laughs> much respect to you and I think it's an achievement worth lauding my only issue is is that if it played in the Black Real Awards for television along with Lovecraft I think both those two things would sweep so we were <laughs> we were trying to put it in a in a better position if we had it in in the the later television awards versus putting it in the overcrowded uh, you know, uh, Black Real Awards this year. And it really is crowded because we're on the spoilers page, Shereen, and I see one, two, three movies that could make an argument to be on this front slide and they're on the spoiler slide. So there were 10 films this year that I thought were really, really strong in a year where at most, Cordell, we might get four. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You can well, I mean, make your choices movies. as the leader, but I just put, I wanted to put my thoughts out there. All right. I got you. So Cordell, do we have, I mean, we literally only got about 10 minutes, man. So we can actually just talk about uh, the best picture category because the rest of it is kind of, you know, I don't think we have enough time to really run through it. You're looking at this slide. Sylvie's love is a movie that um, I made no secret of my love for this movie um, and as you talked earlier about none of these films were hood films or slave films, here <laughs> is just a straight romance that um, I thought the chemistry between uh, Thompson and, and, not, and uh, I, what's, what's the brother's name? Namdi, Namdi, um, what is the damn? I can't believe I'm forgetting this, I'm blanking on his last name. Namdi Asamwa. Um, I thought their chemistry was great. Uh, who's the sister that played her cousin? Um, from Birth of oh, a Nation. Oh, I'm Naomi. Naomi. Uh, Something Naomi King. King. Yeah, Naomi. Asia, Asia Naomi King. Yeah. Um, I thought she was fantastic, even in a small role. Um, my dude from The Wire, um, <laughs> who played Tessa Thompson's father. I thought he was good. Yeah, he was um, great. Alano Miller, who is the jilted lover, who is eternally number two, uh, <laughs> raising another man's baby. I mean, I mean, so there was so many great messages in this film. And then the fact that the wardrobe from the from the late 50s, early 60s is on point. Uh, Eugene Ash gets the music right. Um, it's so funny because there's a scene which is in the, the you know, you have this poster here uh, when Jackie Wilson, someone to care. Now, we all heard that in Coming to America, but I never heard like the song <laughs> song. We just kind of heard like a piece of it. In this film, they played the song. I'm like, my God, man. He, he really nailed that. Uh, Shireen, did you love this movie as much as I did? I did not love it as much as you did, but I really enjoyed the film. I really, really enjoyed it. What do you mean you didn't love this? This is a love story. What did you not like about this movie? It, it, there, okay, so... 
there is nothing that I did not like about this movie. I thought it was beautiful. I love that they shot it on studio lots, which yeah. gave it that sense of old Hollywood glamour. Right. It just added that that atmosphere to it. I think that, um, uh, and I don't know how to properly pronounce his name, which I need to find out, but Nambi Nambi Asamoah. Asmuga. I, I, I think, I don't know, we, we'll find out together because y'all kept calling Daniel Kaluuya, uh, Daniel Kaluuya. So I was like, well, Daniel Kaluuya. Kaluuya. Okay. Well, the and, reason I say that is because when I said Daniel Kaluuya, he answered me. So I'm like, I'm assuming that's not it. I mean, sometimes when people call me Sharon, I'm like, let me go ahead and answer you. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, you know, and, and so I, I thought he did an amazing, really uh, simmering kind of performance. We already know Tessa Thompson is great. The whole cast was great. It's beautifully shot. So I really enjoyed the movie. There's not anything wrong with this movie at all. Matter of fact, it you know I I think about this film La La Land, right? And I and I, I and I feel like this film does that same kind of thing, that love of jazz, mm -hmm. that that really emotional, not always rational romance and, and where it goes in, in that, you know, in, in that way. So I really enjoyed it. Nothing to not do. I just didn't lo love it like you loved it, but that doesn't mean it's not a great film. I, I recommend it. All right, Cordell, what, what about you and uh, this film? Yeah, I also uh, thought it was a great film. Um, to Shireen's point, I didn't like outright loved it um, as opposed to the other films that we talked about earlier. Um, I thought it was beautifully shot. Um, the production design and costumes were on point. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was also just refreshing just to see a classic black love story. Um, for me growing up watching film, I loved like the Sidney Poitier films like For the Love of Ivy and just seeing black people in the positive light um so it was great just to have that throwback to those um type of films um another film i like to highlight on this group here is like the 40 year old version oh um, my god man. yes no. right a blank yes yes I, I want somebody to get um i know you can go to youtube and check it out uh poverty porn the the song that she 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 <laughs> man i was like sitting there and, and the thing that bothered me i'm glad you brought this up cordell about the 40 year old version, not that I didn't like it. I just wanted more Rada spitting on film. I was like, that's it? So Rada like, she has the, yeah, I mean the famous scene where she goes and she's uh, about to, she, she hits, the, hits the weed before she hits the stage. And I was like, I was so mad because I was like, man, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm expecting this film to be more eight mile-ish that we're gonna see her display her skills. And we see her display her humanity, which I thought was even better. But yeah, I, I really dug the 40 year old version and the fact that she makes a, a She's Gotta Have It esque uh, Spike Lee intro story that she writes, directs, produces, and stars in. Man, that's pretty special for Rada Blank. And just to go back to just the, the unique storytelling with these films, I mean, you don't get a chance to see a Black woman of a particular age, at least in her 40s, and a particular, you know, body type that's front and center, you know, she has, you know, guys coming at her, you know, she's, you know, at a point where she's at that crossroads in terms of what her next career steps is going to be. But then you also just see her personal connection with, you know, dealing with the death of her mother, mm -hmm. um, connecting with her brother. Um, I thought it was just a great story, um, great movie, and it's just great to be you know, unique stories like this being um, seen to the masses. Shireen, yeah, I called it a coming of age story for the second time around. Shireen, but he forgot the homeless dude across the street that provides a lot of the comedy. Yeah, the home, yeah, yeah, that every, but I really enjoyed this, every facet of this movie. Like you said, it you can see Rada Blank's love of Spike Lee films. It is very present here, but what she does, even as a child, I did not like She's Gotta Have It. As a woman, as or as a young woman, something felt off about the portrayal of the, the uh, what is it, Nola Darling character. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I hesitate to use the word correct and have Spike knock on my door, but it feels like Rada corrects a lot of what 
was what was viscerally wrong for me about she's got to have it. That was and Spike so, Lee. He's at the <laughs> oh, Yeah, I'm, I'm like, you know, but th there's something that she corrects here where this this coming of age in, in this next part of your life, it, it felt so vibrant and so funny. And I actually was more enamored of the love story here than I was in Sylvie's love. Wow. This love story connected with me more the way that the producer character saw her. Mm -hmm. He saw her from right. the beginning and that journey that they undertake together in the making of the music and wow. how that journey is also, as Cordell mentioned, healing her in her, her hour of mourning. So I got to give big applause to Rada Blank for what she accomplished here. The boldness of shooting it in black and white, it, not just as a a kind of a budgetary thing, but as a part of the craft. Man, well, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, and I got we got limited time. So I wanted to just quickly say that since I saw this actress in a film called American Violet back in 2008, 2009, I have been madly head over heels in love with Nicole Bahari. And, um, you know, I saw her in a small indie. I don't know, uh, Shireen, if you ever saw it. My Last Day Without You. Yes. Um, this is a woman who I, I really am upset with, who I think does not work enough. Um, and, and in this Juneteenth, she, she is absolutely heartbreaking as this mother who is, you know, working multiple jobs, pushing her daughter. You know, she had a, a beauty pageant pass and it didn't work out for her like it worked out for some of her other colleagues. And she is just so good in this movie. So good. It's just the fact that nobody's talking about Nicole Bahari is not because of her, it's because the studio, the small indie production that they, they made, that they, they don't have the money to really push her but she should literally be in every awards conversation. Um, Cordell, I mean, I know you liked Miss Juneteenth. Um, what did you think about Nicole Bahari? Yeah, uh, to your point, Tim, you know, Nicole is just one of those actresses who I feel just doesn't get the opportunities that she deserves. I mean, she's a talented actress. Um, every time I've watched her in anything, my eyes are glued, you know, to the screen just because she just has that it factor. Um, that you can't explain. Um, I thought with Miss Juneteenth, to your point, I thought it was a very nuanced performance. It was a very real performance. Um, you know, with these types of movies, it could either go one way or another. And I felt it was a perfect balance in terms of just being a mother and, you know, going through the daily struggles of what it is to be a mother. And um, I hope that the voters, you know, were able to watch this film um, I hope that it does really well in terms of our nominations. And I hope that Nicole and uh, the young actress who plays her daughter um, get some recognition for this film. Shireen, your thoughts on Miss Juneteenth? Well, I'll first say that I do love Nicole Bahari and she does seem to keep getting cheated. She was cheated when she led the, the series of uh, Sleepy Hollow in which she was outstanding. Yep. And they didn't understand what they had. And again, she's outstanding here in this truly indie film where there, there's something really powerful about how a parent's dreams eventually are visited upon a child. And, and, and that pressure point it creates in some relationships. And that exploration in this film and, and the, the kind of work ethic of this mother and trying to kind of, to kind of revitalize her own dreams, but then recognize her child as some as someone separate. It's, it's really good stuff. And Nicole Bahari just she just she has a way that people should recognize her in a similar way to Regina King, but it doesn't seem to happen. And so like the two of you, I hope that more people see this film and that more people recognize this talent. Now we're gonna end with uh, two films that were on the earlier slide and they both have one person in common, which is why I put grouped them together when we talk about the five bloods 
and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And of course, that is the tragic early death of Chadwick Boseman, um, who, you know, and, and, and outside of Heath Ledger, I'm trying to think of other actors who their last film was maybe their best performance. Uh, Chadwick Boseman in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, of course, it's, you know, I tell people it's set up in a way that if you've ever watched Dream Girls on stage or Dream Girls the film, no matter who you cast and all the other roles, Effie is the movie. Yes. Uh, in the Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Levy is the movie. Uh, and Chadwick Boseman took Levy on at a time when his health, as we now know, wasn't 100%. And he literally gives the best performance of his career. And it was so bittersweet to watch that early screening of uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. But he's equally as effective in a, in a smaller role in, in The Five Bloods because so much of that film is based on their love and remembrance, or remembrance of Storm and Norman that, that Bozeman plays. Uh, Shireen, I'll start with you. Uh, the, the Bozeman factor is huge, right? So let's say hypothetically Chadwick Bozeman is still alive. Mm -hmm. Is he getting as, a mu as much acclaim for these movies now as, as opposed to what the current situation is? Wait, you're saying would I'm he... saying that he's great in both films, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. if he's not looked at uh, in, in a way that, you know, that like this is his last film and, you know, you thought he had more work ahead of him. Black Panther 2 was coming. Um, do we, are we still thinking about his performance in both of these films exactly the same way? I, I think that's impossible. There is no way to think about those performances in the same way. Do, because it was such a loss for all of us. We, right. I, we all really felt his loss and and how sudden it seemed to most of us. Right. So, but but what I will say is that were had he were he still here with us, mm -hmm. we would still be talking about how great he is, especially as you said, as Levy in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, where he just he just snatches you by the face and jerks you right into the screen. Mm -hmm. And every time he's on, you have no choice but to watch him. So I can say that. Right. Now, Cordell and uh, Delroy Lindo is also uh, an actor who, you know, and it's funny because, you know, you take people for granted, right? You know, they, they're they always there. They're doing the work. Um, a couple of nights ago at the Critics' Choice Association, Delroy Lindo got a Lifetime Achievement Award. And as they're playing all of these clips, I'm like, what's Indian Archie? He was in Clockers. He was, I'm like, Delroy Lindo has just been solid for like 30 years, man. This dude has been killing it. Um, is this the year that Delroy Lindo, I'm, I'm sure he's going to do well. I mean, because I think the our voting academy is really going to respond to what they what he put on celluloid in uh, The Five Bloods. But is this the year that he breaks through and has a, a real shot at a, at a Best Actor nomination this year? Or is he in, is he in support? lead yeah best he's actor. lead okay is this his year that he can step up and really get some recognition uh i believe so i mean i think you know he's a spoiler to chadwick boseman but i mean chadwick is just a lot for best actor i'm calling it now <laughs> i mean the fact that he just gave his all in this performance and to out act viola davis <laughs> is a lot to say in itself um, I mean, Delroy Lindo, I'm happy that, you know, he is now given an opportunity to get his flowers and to get the respect that he's been overlooked for so many years. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, with this performance that it gives him more opportunities in film to really get even more acclaim um, that he deserves. But I think Chadwick is a lock for Ma Rainey. Um, and in terms of the Five Bloods, when it comes down with Chadwick, um, had he not passed, I don't think he would have gotten as much attention um, for the Five Bloods. Um, however, when I initially watched the Five Bloods, like for me, the supporting performances was like Clark Peters and Jonathan Majors. But after Chadwick passed, like you have a greater appreciation for the performance um, after watching it again. So I could see why, you know, now that performance has resonated uh, with voters across the various awards groups 
and um, with our voters potentially as well. All right, so last one before we get out of here, and I'm gonna throw this at Shireen immediately. Uh, no disrespect to John David Washington, who I thought, uh, you know, is a, has an amazing career ahead of him. But Malcolm and Marie is about Zendaya, right? And Zendaya, oh my goodness, she, she. No, I, no, no, but but let me let me ask you the question first. I was going to say it's about Zendaya, but I think I, for our awards, you know, the two of them are going to battle it out, being Andre Day and Zendaya. But in the for the Academy Awards. Um, I don't, I don't see a world. And, and if I, and if it happens, I am going, my mouth is going to hit the floor in shock that Amy Adams will, able, will be able to get an Oscar nomination for best actress this year over one of these two ladies. And I'm thinking Andra Day has probably got the stronger shot because, you know, she is Billie Holiday and she's the, you know, the whole movie is centered around her. Uh, Zendaya is sharing screen with John David Washington but she is really the focal point of the film. Uh, Shireen, what are you thinking as it relates to uh, her chances and, and, and her performance in Malcolm and Marie? In the words of Donald Glover, this is America. <laughs> so if you don't think Amy Adams can <laughs> win above these two women, not on merit, but on this being America, then you haven't seen the Golden Globe nominations, which oh, make no, no, no sense whatsoever. Oh, I saw them, but I'm I'm thinking that's just them crazy Hollywood foreign press people, man. The, okay. uh, the Academy yeah. will get this thing right. Well, you know what? Keep hope alive. <laughs> so what do you think I, about it? I, but, but Zendaya, Zendaya is, you know, it, she's another one who is outstanding all the time. She's another one who, everything, Zendaya is brilliant. And I'm going to tell you why. Every character that she plays has a different posture. They have a different uh, body language. And if you notice the character that she plays in Malcolm and Marie of Marie, there's this thing she does where her chin is always tilted up, always up the chin, always jutting up and out as though this woman is trying to keep her head above water, trying to stay above the past and above the, the, the pain that this relationship causes. When you watch her in a, a film like uh, the Spider-Man series or films like the Spider-Man series, MJ has a different physicality. The shoulders are hunched. She's leaned in. The way that the paces that the eyes go, the cadence. Zendaya does this with every, every single character she plays and people miss it because she's so good. She's so good that you don't realize she's that good. It just seems natural. Right. But if you really go in there and you watch her, she does things with character that let me tell you, let me tell you. Because what happens with Andrew Day is you've got Billy Holiday to use, yeah. right? Hmm. That's a Good lot. Point. You know, and not only do you have Billy Holiday, but you have D Diana Ross, who is a, a like an an underlauded actress. Like Diana Ross is actually a very good actress, right? But so you have all this richness of Billie Holiday where you do just a little thing here and there and you got it. It's like what, you know, it's like what impressionists do. They do a little thing here and there and we know who that is. Zendaya is is in creating. Wow. Okay, that's interesting because I think you know, I, I, and I was hoping you were done. I didn't cut you off. That I thought Zendaya. I mean, not Zendaya, but uh, Andre Day was superior to Diana Ross in Lady Sings the Blues. Oh, oh, by far, by far. That's not my point. And, my and point I also is thought that the screenplay for that film is superior to what uh, and the direction is superior. That Lee Daniels did a much better job than Barry Gordy. Um, so yes, yeah, but that's, that's a, not my point. You're, you make a very good point, but that's not what I'm saying. What right. I'm saying is you have a library. Right. Andrew Day is incredible. Nothing is being taken from her. She is incredible. If she wins, I will say well-deserved because she deserves it. And I think she should win probably in, in, in the United States versus Billie Holiday more than maybe Zendaya should win in a Malcolm and Marie. But that wasn't my point. My point was, Zendaya is just bringing it. Oh, every time, every <laughs> single time, and and without a library, there's she's not using any uh, anything that we know that is like shorthand. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what I meant. Wow, man, you know Shireen is the bomb. Cordell, 
<laughs> you got the last word on this one, man. You know, the, this this inevitable this inevitable back and forth between these two ladies this award season. Uh, but let's talk about Zendaya specifically. Uh, do you concur with Shireen uh, for her performance in Malcolm and Marie? I definitely do, 100%. Um, I think with, this, with Zendaya, what she's done great in her career is making smart choices. Because as you know, with a lot of, you know, child stars, it's once they try to make that transition to becoming an adult, they usually just go left in terms of their choices, whether it's just an overly sexual role or whatever the case may be. But with Zendaya, she wants to make sure that she respects the craft in return to get respect in the industry, as opposed to just doing a role to say, say, hey, I'm shedding my Disney image, I'm an adult. Um, so I applaud her for really just taking the craft seriously and letting it happen organically instead of just forcing it on the audience. Man, well, you know what, man? I, I think that, you know, we've highlighted over the course of this last hour at least 10 films <laughs> that I think are, are worthy of votes. And then there's some other spoilers that were down there. Uh, I thought his house was scary as hell. And, and, and because of that, I still haven't finished it because it freaked me out. I was like, I'm done <laughs> I'm <not> watching that. <laughs> uh, Farewell or More was a movie I really liked a lot. The Old Guard, uh, you know, uh, Kiki Lane, who was in it, Beale Street Can Talk, co-stars in that with, the, uh, with uh, Char Charlize Theron. And can't wait for part two. Gina Prince Bythewood, uh, you know, you're not getting all the love from from all of the awards organizations, but you know, I love me some Gina Prince Bythewood. Uh, you know, I've known her for about 15 years. Good sister, man. Good sister. But I want to thank um, our, you know, Shireen Nicole, who, you know, I tease her a lot, and she's like, I almost look at her as like a baby sister, but. Shireen knows her stuff, and I love her perspective, which is why she hears me say it over and over that I call her smart sister. <laughs> so, you know, you'll see Shireen again. Well, let me rephrase that. You will not see Shireen. Her beauty filter. <laughs> <laughs> you but know, Shireen... I just, Tim, I just turned the beauty filter up until I was like, oh, I look good now. <laughs> <That's> funny. <laughs> but I want to thank Shireen Nicole for joining us for this conversation. Uh, Cordell Martin, co-host. Uh, as I said, the Black Reel Awards uh, take place on Sunday, April the 11th. We will announce nominations on Wednesday, uh, February the 18th. And My birthday! Was, yes, birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> and we will start voting on Monday. I can't wait to see Shireen's face because she's going to have to pick some of these movies. So <laughs> we'll see what she's got. Uh, as we tell you guys, please see something good at the movies. Uh, and, you know, you got all types of choices. A lot of these movies are playing on uh, streaming services all over the place, uh, except for Judas and the Black Messiah and the U.S. versus Billy Holiday. The rest of these movies you can catch on streaming services. So until next time, you guys take care. And I think Cordell is going to have to take us out of here. Um, and you guys enjoy your day. You guys take care.